And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a new couple newcomers to the temple. They are Pro Prov and Logan, the double-headed monster of, L of LD3D. Host of the interact, host of the interactive show, lovingly known, lovingly known as Prov Must Die, <laughs> and cre and creators of the of the four the four section part known as the Traveler's Guide to Primordia. We have well, as I mentioned before, Logan and Prov. <laughs> how are you doing? Hello. How are you guys doing today? We're pretty good. It's uh, fantastic standard British weather over here. So it's raining. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for having us on. It's an honor to be here. Yeah. At, I'll give I'll give you credit on one thing at the very least. Um, you're you're um you're not complaining about the cold yet. Um. That's. Oh, well, this is British summertime. <laughs> we're, we're all lizards, so we're very used to the cold weather. We thought we just we thrive on it now. Yeah, it's just it's just that from my experience, um. British cold and mid and Midwestern U.S. cold are not the same. <laughs> yeah, with us, yeah, if it's raining, we're like, oh, it's cold. If it's cold over there, I'm fairly certain there's a blizzard. That's so fucking cold. Yeah. Um, there, it's the difference between cold and stay the fuck inside. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what a coffee. Well, we don't really get <laughs> snow much where we are. Central UK, we get about three days of snow. But what three days now? Three, three days. Oh, yeah. I get incredible three days. But... I get I get snow, and I'm guessing it's nothing but powder. No, nothing, re nothing really sticks about. No, no. no. We'll complain about it though. <laughs> oh yeah, the country grinds to a halt if there's snow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've um, I've seen I've, I've seen I've seen that I've seen that kind of set that kind of setup whenever, whenever any whenever any of my buddies down south end up get end up getting. Even just a tiny bit of snow, everybody goes into panic mode, which yeah. is understandable because around here, once it's once it starts snowing, the plows are the plows are are out and about before before the sun even rises. <laughs> they get they get out there fast, but a lot of a lot of places down south don't have that infra don't have the setup for that kind of thing. And yeah, friends in Texas thought that the world was ending when it snowed. Oh yeah, I, I end up getting I end up getting a bunch I end up getting a bunch of my out of country friends messaging me thinking that I was caught in, and I'm like, that's in that was in Texas. I'm in Minnesota. <laughs> like, I could be up to I could be up to my ass in snow, and 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 this and schools still won't close. I mean, that that's the nature of school. They could be on fire, and they'd be like, you know what? Stay. <laughs> We're not closing. Get there. Just, just, just burn a bit. To be fair, our schools <laughs> decide to close after we've already sent the kids there. The kids get to school, we go to work, then we get a call to say the school is closing. Yeah, but um, and w and whenever whenever I bring up how cold it gets in in January, <laughs> a lot of a lot of folks go, "How how the hell do you survive that?" Same way any same way anybody does, <laughs> dress in layers. That's it, many layers. Just to the point, can I congratulate you on your uh, fantastic British conversation skills here? Because we've opened the conversation and we've instantly gone to talking about the weather. <laughs> you guys are not my first rodeo when it comes when it comes to <laughs> dealing with Brits. You guys are not my first. You're not, and you're probably not going to be my last. And because and because and because of that. Um, I've got I've gotten my I've gotten my fair share of I've gotten my fair share of experience plus um a long a long time ago long before I started this channel a a work a work buddy of mine tuned tuned me into Premier League uh. <laughs> which helped which helped it which helped as a, helped as a bit of, helped as a bit of a um exper, exper, helped a bit when it came to getting experience especially since um. I li I like foot I like football chants. 
especially, especially the more creative <laughs> <Yeah>. ones. <laughs> and even, that's really my area of expertise. <laughs> oh. Look, I, I realize I realize that it's I realize that it's out of the that it's out of the norm for tabletop for a tabletop geek like me to be to be, to have any interest in sports, but I just see it as one more avenue for more memes. In hundred percent. Well, yeah, it's not. Oh. <laughs> I agree with you though. The chants are generally ridiculous and epic. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Okay. Um, Walk me through what your first introduction, respectively, to role-playing games was, and what was it that made it stick? I'll let you go first. Okay, well, many, many years ago, 3 BC, 27 years ago, I played my first role-playing game, uh, which was, way back then, that was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition, which was a ridiculously sized tome, but it's really all we could get its hands on. Yeah, I, had, I, I still have my copy of that, and it's a it's a royal pain in the ass to get to get that to get that on a shelf without putting it sideways. In some cases, yeah, absolutely, it did not match anything else. Mm -hmm. I played that with friends. Um, I had a, a friend from school who was a year older than me. He played it a little, and then he wanted to play himself. So he looked around looking for another Dungeon Master, Games Master, mm -hmm. and somehow I was volunteered, involuntary volunteer. <laughs> and so I, I created um, a world, I created a small village, I put a well and I put a tavern and I put a blacksmith and I had goblins coming out of the well and that was the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I played for 27 years and I've run games for 27 years and that little village is still in the setting of the world that would become Primordia. So a homebrew setting that's taken 27 years to develop has gone from a village to having uh, nations and maps with borders and uh, kingdoms and... Uh, what, what are Jupiter's one? Duchies, that's the one. That's the word I need. Empires rising and falling, a long and varied history. Mm -hmm. So really, I'm still playing that first game from when I was 11. Never really stopped. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I've forays into other games. I've played in other people's games. I've played other systems. I've played other setting types. I've done the superhero thing. I've done the spy thing, the sci-fi thing. I always fall back to medium to high fantasy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where my world comfortably sits. Oh, yeah. How did you start? <laughs> Ah, uh, not with such uh, privileged beginnings, my friend. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, throwing that card in straight away. Uh, myself, I didn't get into tabletop role-playing until much later, because um, I was born in a very small, small town called Bradford, and being of Indian descent, um, in a very Indian and brown town, uh, there was not a lot of, a lot of fantasy tabletop role-playing going on <laughs> when you that younger. It's more like, yo son, go do the vacuuming. <laughs> no time for all of this kind of thing going on. Um, so uh, I didn't really get into it until I moved, moved elsewhere. And uh, I think I was about 15, 16. Mm -hmm. uh, my first foray was a couple of friends because we all kind of uh, were the outcasts of the school. So we were all in the corner where all the cool kids and popular ones would just hang out. And we were all just looking around. And then one of us was like, do you, want to, do, you want to, do you want to play this game? And I was like, yeah, that, that sounds nice. Cool. Friends. I have friends now. <laughs> and so we all sat around this lovely table. They told me about all these monsters and I could be, a, I could be an elf, I could be a dwarf. And I felt quite happy with the, the dwarf. So I made a dwarf and rogue. Uh, his name was Inchy Pinchy. And uh, it was, the campaign was, it was, it was brilliant because what sticks, what sticks around with me, the reason why I, I feel so passionately now towards uh, tabletop role-playing, fantasy, and just general, any, anything where you get to be creative is uh, the sense of inclusivity. At that point, we weren't the outcasts, we were the heroes, and we had a bond, and it was being able to, um, being able to be anything we wanted to be. There was no borders, there was no boundaries, 
There was nobody telling us we couldn't be this thing. We could be the heroes we wanted to be. We could do whatever we wanted. And uh, that's, that's the main thing that has always stuck with me. Uh, that's, why I love, that's why I love fantasy, because it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, you can literally be, do anything. And that sense of uh, community that you get with playing it as well. And that's, that's the main reason why I love it so much. Oh, it's like you belong. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> oh. Well, you, you, forget, you, forgot one, you forgot one little um, asterisk on that. Is the fact is the fact that there is no pure measure, there is no pure representative of equality than the than the dice gods, because it does, yes. it does not matter. It does not matter your it does not matter your age, occupation, gen yes. gender, con country of or country of origin. The dice gods hate you. Yes, <laughs> I know that well. <laughs> Uh, I am forever rolling low, well, and I have forever been probably the worst uh, <laughs> tabletop role player you will ever meet. So much so that we made an entire show around it. That's why it's called Proud Must Die, because I am forever failing at everything. Any any decision I always make, the dice forever hate me. We've had 36 episodes so far. I have rolled, the stats are there, I have rolled six natural 20s. And I have rolled over 30 natural ones. Yes. <laughs> yes. And a, I'm, I'm guessing that there was a whole lot of, fl of flop rolls that weren't, that weren't natural ones, which is probably the worst part. Yeah, rolling, rolling low without critically failing is worse than critically failing. It's critically failing, still something dramatic happens. Exactly. But just failing, rolling a three, that's just depressing. Yeah, and again, I do... <laughs> but I can test that theory. <clears throat> I happen to have here two d20s. Go ahead, Brad, roll this d20. And I'll roll. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I don't want to do it live. Alright, you roll. <laughs> 17. <laughs> Four. <laughs> there we go. Can I have another? Can I have a do over? No, there's no rerolls. <laughs> no, sorry, no take backs. No take backs. I'm in an interview. Doing an interview. At least let me roll higher than a ten. <laughs> Give me that. Give me that. But um, Where's that whiskey? Where's that flask? Let me have a sip. Yeah. Now with the, with that in mind, I was I was going I was going to ask how uh, prim how Primordia got set up, but you can't you kind of already an you kind of already answered that in the si in the sense that this had this was a homebrew that just that just um a set a homebrew setting that just kind of expanded into its own thing. Um, yeah. But given given the fact that it is, a I have two questions to kind of further go on to that. One, um, I I'd, I'd like you to go into the um, chain of events that led to just create just creating these four these four um, locations. In the, that would become the Traveler's Guide to Primordia, and two, um, was it was it the case where that where this was where this was used in one particular um, one particular fantasy game, or did or did you end up transferring this particular setting to different fantasy games over the years? Okay, absolutely. Um, so the idea of having the four modular books, setting guides, came about from essentially starting to play with Prav. Because I've developed the setting for 27 years. And Prav didn't want to read 700 pages worth of notes. He just wanted the bits that were relevant to where he was and what he was doing. So the idea of having this, an entire setting guide for a world that is as big and as highly developed as mine is Making that modular seemed like an accessible thing for everybody. You don't need the whole volume, you just need the chapters that you want to play with. And you can expand at your own pace. That's how that came about. Right? Yeah. Um, when we first started this, uh, this venture together, obviously it was at the start of the uh, pandemic. Mm. Uh, I'd just been made redundant and this 
loving person here uh, needed somebody to do all the work that he didn't want to, so he brought me on board. <laughs> and then we started talking about, oh, we've got, I've got an idea, I want to do a show. And then I was like, okay. And then we started spinning some different ideas about it being um, chat-based, uh, huge interaction. And then he was like, well, I've got a setting for it. And he showed me his wall, which has, it looks like a beautiful mind. There are so many post-it notes on there, I go blind looking at it. And um, I literally had this discussion with him. He was like, well, what do you think about that? And I said, in the nicest way, the reason why I don't normally get to play a lot is because uh, when it comes to tabletop role playing, either it's um, too expensive, uh, so I could, due to economic standings for myself, I'm not particularly rich, um, but because it's normally too expensive, I either can't buy the modules, or there's such a big tome, um, I like reading, but I'm not like the best reader, <laughs> so that kind of puts me off. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll buy them if I can, but they kind of just kind of take up desk dust on the shelf while I look at them going, oh, that's really nice, I'll try and get reading on to this thousand page tome to play a game of make-believe. Um, again, they are brilliant, but my attention span and the reading isn't uh, to pass. So I was like, I like the idea of what you've got here. How about making it more accessible for people who um, can't read so well <laughs> and also don't have a lot of money. And so we literally put our heads together and that's where the idea of it becoming modular. So instead of having to learn about every in and out of a particular world, because that's not normally how you play, you normally start in a small little area for a while and then branch out. So yeah, four different books with four different areas and also the wording and the descriptions of everything are a lot easier to read now as well. It's great having this flowing language and everything like that, but sometimes it can kind of throw some people off, especially if you're like myself and you've just started, or as I said, not, not very good at focusing my intentions on anything for any particular amount of time. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the reason why we came together and decided to make, make these so it could be a little bit more inclusive to bring more people on board and so more people can enjoy the lovely work that, that this person has done. Oh, thank you very much. You're most welcome. As for the second point, you paid me for that. Over the course of <laughs> developing Primordia as a setting, it has been utilised in a number of different TTRPG rule systems. I'd say it started with Warhammer Fantasy 1st Edition. Mm -hmm. A majority of it was built during Warhammer Fantasy 2nd Edition. It's been through Dungeons & Dragons uh, 3.5 through to the current 5th Edition. I've used it in a Star Trek game as a lesser developed planet that the, uh, the away team was descending into. The entire thing is oh, system the, agnostic. Yeah, we so, superhero. was a superhero. Superheroes, yeah. What was that? Silver Age. Silver Age Sentinel Age. Yeah. Uh, a variation upon the 3.5 model. I like that. I was a speedster. One of, uh, a lot of number crunching involved in that one. But yeah, it's, it's system agnostic. It can be dropped into any rule system in theory. There, there is a, there is a small part, there is a small part of me that it that both that both one that both wonders if it could it could be dropped into GURPS and also, I feel I feel very bad for anybody who's tr who's trying to who would be trying to wrangle wrangle with um GURPS or Hero with <laughs> with it within this setup just in general, but um, I suppose it could I suppose it could be worse. You could try and play this in Palladium Fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> Look, also, it's doable. It is doable. It is do it is doable, but the problem is you're still using the Palladium system in that case. Well, yeah. Oh. All the TTRPGs are available. <laughs> Look, all critics have their whipping boys, and Kevin Ciambetta has been has been mine for decades. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has a place in the system. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, with that, with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind, I would like to, before we get before we get into the nitty gritty about what's about what's in them, I would like to get into the kind of the kind of theming, um, with the, with each um, with each of the four books. Mm -hmm. And in that and in that the, in that theming to kind to kind of go over the 
the kind of the kind of stories that it potentially le that potentially leans towards more than more than others. So I'll start. Absolutely. I'll start with the Ice Bristle Peaks. Yes. The Ice Bristle Peaks, uh, a mountainous frozen region, on the edge of what is currently the southwest of Primordia, although the world is ever expanding. It is uh, largely lawless. It has very much a, a Star Wars most icy feel to it. It is within the Empire, but they don't have much presence there. They tend to do their own thing. Uh, it's it's a dangerous place. There are monsters there. There are yetis. There are woolly rhinos. Trade routes there are dangerous. There are mines scattered throughout these mountains that have a wealth of untapped resources underneath, but you've got to be hardy enough to go find them and then defend them. The modules themselves contain various plot hooks based on that region, or based on whichever region the module is, to allow you to get an idea of where the story could go. You've got plot hooks for NPCs versus plot hooks for player characters. You've got plot hooks for areas and things that you might stumble across. And nothing is set in stone. These are just ideas for the aspiring Dungeon Master, Games Master, Storyteller to just steer something in a certain direction. For example, in the Ice Crystal Peaks, if you want to introduce the idea of the giant kin, who are the, the vague equivalent of the Goliaths from D&D, Rather than just having one stumble upon the party and go, hello, I'm Bob the Giant King, we have a plot hook generator, so it writes a story based around the lore of that culture, just by rolling a couple of tables and having them introduce themselves to a party in an integrated to the setting kind of way. I, I, can, get, I can get that. Now, that, bring, that brings me to the next one being the... Um... The Kalori Forest. Yes. The Kalori Forest is a magical place. It's got elves. Elves are... Racist. Racist. <laughs> Inherently racist. <laughs> Elitism breeds oh, racism, racism, essentially. It's not a nice place. Um, the elves are very much isolationist, very shut in. They don't consider themselves part of the Empire. The Empire says otherwise. Uh, the forest is intrinsically magical. Everything there is unwillingly tainted by magic. There are unicorns. There are talking signposts that give you directions. There are glowing rainbow trout in the river that will give you special powers if you eat them. Or maybe grand wishes if you don't. Who knows? There are also giant insects that may or may not be from outer space. That's sort of hinted at, but it's down to you as the storyteller of the Dungeon Master to figure out if that's the avenue you want to explore. Mm -hmm. There's also a horrible, horrible underground underneath the uh, the Elven capital of Ipsos, which then leads away to dealing with smugglers and pirates and all sorts of fun things like that. Now, with the, that brings that brings us to Edra City. Yes. Edra City is sort of a... Well, it's the capital of the, uh, of the Empire, so it's featured within the Nightfall Empire module as well, but Edra City deserves its own book because there's so much going on there. Mm -hmm. It is where the current Emperor, Stravominos, sits upon his throne. Boo. Boo, yes. <laughs> Building his armies, preparing for whatever sinister plot he has planned for the rest of the world. It is uh, vaguely sort of steampunk, diesel punk mm -hmm. sort of set setting, so you can twist that and tweak that to fit how you want, or drag elements to other modules, depending on how you want to play. The idea is that everything is mix and match. Mm -hmm. There are, there are um, automated soldiers, which are a play on the uh, the D D Warforge, but are different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Copyright. <laughs> There are um, there are magical shops. There are blacksmiths churning out uh, enchanted dark iron. The buildings there are all encased in bits of metal to defend them from magical attacks. The whole city is almost a fortress within itself. 
there's the slums of the dredge scattered outside those people deemed too poor or unskilled to take part in the larger workings of the city, which makes for great adventures, let's face it. If you want to run across rooftops and chase bad guys through alleyways, then the slums is where to do it because it's fun and exciting and you can have all sorts of interesting characters lurking in the shadows or even just in the marketplace in the streets there. Um, and last but certainly not least would be the Nightfall Empire. The Nightfall Empire itself, the area, is pretty much similar to our our home our homeland here in uh, here in Yorkshire, Yorkshire, in the north of England, which is central UK. It is it is rolling hills. It is little cottages. It is. Vast spaces of empty wilderness with dotted farmlands. Plenty of pubs. Plenty of pubs, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, the idea being that I wanted to be able to look at my surroundings in reality and transition that to an idea of a world of fantasy. There are plenty. There's plenty of lore, folklore, and things from around these parts that makes. It alludes to old myth and legend. There's plenty of talk about furry and stuff that happens around these parts, and then going down into Wales, which is obviously where it's very famous. We've got all sorts of interesting waterfalls and cave systems here. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just instantly generates plot hooks for any sort of role-playing game. We have, not too far from where we live, we have a waterfall that turns things to stone if you hang it in the water. I've been a number of times. I used to go as a child, and it was fantastic. Now, if that's not just saying, oh, that waterfall hides a cave behind which looks a basilisk, I don't know what is. <laughs> so it is, it is rolling hills of his farmlands, it is uh, hard working, salt of the earth type chaps like us, struggling like us. against the oppressive empire that is looming over them mm -hmm. with uh, Edra City sat in the middle. And. Yeah. <laughs> since, you, since you brought up basilisk, if you listen close in the distance, you can you can you can hear some archaeologists going, "Why did it have to be snakes?" <laughs> yes, <laughs> snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Um, and snakes. I'm the bloody end. To be to be fair, I will admit that when I read the description of the uh, of the ice bris of the ice bristle peaks of this. Of this fro of this fro of this frozen re of this frozen region that that mo that most civilized folk who dare dared not tread. I'm just sitting there going, I feel like I'm being called out. Because <laughs> 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 that feel because that feels like my that feels like my neck of the woods half the friggin' year. <laughs> oh. Perhaps so. We all find similarities in uh, in various settings. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. we just mean you are obviously the hero of our times, already living in these harsh realities. Oh, um, but I I do think I do think it's kind of funny that I end up making an Indiana Jones um joke joke earlier because would it be would it be off the mark of me to say that when it came to the depiction of the Empire and a lot and a lot of a lot of the territories on the frontier of it. That something like Star, something like Star Wars or even um, Firefly was an influence. Absolutely, I mean, I am, by my own admission, a professional geek. That <laughs> this this is my life. I'm thirty <laughs> years of age, and I still read comics. I still watch sci-fi. There's, there's no, you're never too old for this sort of stuff. So yeah, absolutely, all of those things are very much an influence on everything I do. There are. <laughs> There's a reason that there are masters of the fantasy setting. There's a reason that we have best-selling books and why we have movies that win awards is because they're good, and therefore they seep into the collective subconscious of geekdom, mm -hmm. and we draw from that, and we make pop culture references, and those things then leak into each other's products, into each other's designs and ideas. Everything, it's all the same. It's all the same thing. There's no original idea anymore. Um, we just steal from each other, and everybody I, seems to be happy with that. I think my, I think my mentor, I think my mentor once said that if you steal from one guy, it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen guys, it's research. Exactly. Hey, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I do. Um, it's not like that. It's not like that precedent is anything new. I, 
I uh, one of the one of the greatest one of the greatest running jokes for me in um in look in looking at ta in looking at tabletop scenes is when I get a lot of the um old school crowds who are d who are over examine over examining early D and D books to try to try and figure out what as if there was some sort of um gr grand vision on how on how the game is on how the game's design is supposed to work out and I'm sitting here going. You guys are you guys are acting like you guys are acting like Gygax and Arneson had some grand plan in place, as <laughs> as somebody who's as somebody who's spoken with for, with former TSR developers, I can tell you that's not the case. <laughs> a lot of a lot of it was just that was just them was just them tossing tossing things that they liked into a pot and, and hoping it doesn't explode. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, I got that. Oh. And the and I think I think that brings me to um <clears throat> to a bit to a bit of a question that I end up bringing up a lot in fantasy games. Um, now I tr I've avoided it for as long as I can, but I have to bring up the magic question. <laughs> okay. Because um. Fantasy has many forms, and in fact, one thing I've been critical of um, D and D of over the years is claiming that claiming that it wants to be for all kinds of fantasy. But um, when you actually sit down and look at what it what it's actually doing, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, Warhammer's off the hook when it comes to this kind of thing. It know it knows exactly what sort of fantasy it wants to be, and it doesn't try to be anything more more or less than that. Um, yeah. But with but within that you you've mentioned modularity in t in terms of um adapting this for any sort of rule set um within that within that modularity are are there go are there going to be tips or the like when it comes to tweaking it to lean more into the high fantasy end of things or lean more into the low into the lower fa into the um lower magic set um kind of setup well, the beauty of it is that in the opening paragraphs and the introduction and overview of each module, you are helpfully reminded that none of this is set in stone. So if you don't want to use certain aspects of it, if it doesn't fit your narrative, then don't use it. Mm -hmm. I find a lot of the time people seem to read a setting book and then everything must fall within the parameters of that book and of that setting. Our modules are just suggestions. I can give you ideas, I can tell you how magic works in Primordia, but if you don't want that, then just don't use that section. Everything is free flow, everything, because it's system agnostic, everything had to be loose enough to be adapted to various setting systems. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with so yeah, there, there is a way that magic works, and a narrative to that, and a, a, a rich law behind it. But none of that has to be used. If you don't want it, if you want to have a low magic or no magic game, then go ahead. Just skip over that chapter. Mm -hmm. well, probably stay clear of Glory Forest. Yeah. Well, let let's get let's get let's get into that. Um, t what can you tell me about how magic works in um, pr in Primordia, especially given the um, Especially given the pre the prevalence of going into different magic systems, which some people ye some people yell at Sanderson for going into detail about those kind of things. That's true. That does happen. <laughs> I I have a particular fondness for the works of Mr. Patrick Ruffus mm -hmm. because in the King Killer Chronicles. It is explained how magic works. It's not just a gimmick or, oh, it was magic, so this happened. So I thought, I need that. So I came up with a narrative as to how magic works, how it came about, what happens. It doesn't have to be used, mm -hmm. but I have it. Magic was created by the gods. I have the divine driver out of 50 gods in total, so that's a little tricky. But the first three that landed in Primordia, they created magic. The god Jin Shen created soul and spirit and tied everything together, gave everything a spirit. And everything was connected to everything else, and all of that wove itself together into the tapestry. 
Thousands of years later, wizards can pull upon those strings using certain um, incantations to achieve certain effects. Mm-hmm. If you want to light the, uh, the campfire using magic, then you can do so by pulling on a thread of the tapestry. Unfortunately, a fire goes out somewhere else, but hey, you've got your fire. Sorcerers, on the flip side, just take it into their take it into their own hands and just pull the tapestry apart and reweave it mm-hmm. to achieve an effect. But that's just a that's a, a law based narrative that you cannot can choose to use or not. But I wanted there to be rules. I feel like magic should have rules. You can choose to ignore them if you're not bothered for that in your setting. But as I said, the King Code Chronicles explained magic in that setting. And I thought that was a fantastic thing to do. So I did it. Yeah, because yeah. it's funny, you don't add the element of like causality to any kind of magic. Nothing comes without a price. Yeah. And every, everything must be paid. And exactly. when the way you the way you mentioned that of 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 um of mess of messing with this of messing with this kind of weave, um, is there the is there the po- is is there the possibility in the in the in the way you've got the way you've got it written out that um, magic backlashes are are a potential thing? I you've draw, you've drawn you've drawn too much and now you're and now the and now the weave bites back. Yes, absolutely. If that's a, an element of it that you wish to use and you think that could be interesting for your story, because at the end of the day, all we're doing is telling stories. Mm-hmm. All anybody playing any sort of TTRPG is doing is playing make-believe with friends. So if that's an interesting aspect that makes the drama and good storytelling for your game, then use that bit. But yes, absolutely, there's all sorts of dangers that are inherent with using magic. If you're pulling on the threads of reality, that's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, that one is actually um, going to be part of one of the upcoming books. Not part of the four. Because we just want to start with the four, but there is a Daisies and Fates book that would mm-hmm. cover that, because that will obviously explain uh, where magic is and just so, so for people to go deeper into the law. For this first initial four, we just wanted to kind of allow everybody to get a groundwork out, to get a flavour for the places, um, the creatures, the monsters, and ideas that come from Primordial. Uh, we didn't want to go too law based on the first four, um, hopefully, because <laughs> funded now. Hopefully when it goes out and we get our feedback, we'll be uh, commencing work on the deities, fates, and magics of the world. Mm. Touch wood. <laughs> yeah. Just slap myself in the face. I know, you did. I know, you did. Uh, Perhaps slaps himself in the face quite a lot. Yeah, but uh, that, that shouldn't be let out. <laughs> why, didn't, why didn't they call... If you're slapping yourself that much, why didn't they call you when they remade the Three Stooges? <laughs> Actually, I, I take I take that back. Um, that w- that's a blessing in disguise that they didn't, because we know how remakes work. That is. I want to be clever. Of course, of course, th- of course. I've I'm no I'm no I'm no one to talk be- simply because of the fact that, as in one of my old campaigns to ca- to do the whole distract the guard thing, I ended up using, I ended up bra- I ended up breaking out. A age, a um, an old, cl- an old classic in the form of "Who's the Tank." <laughs> I love that one. You know, <laughs> who's the tank? What's the mage? I don't know. Who's the I don't know. Who's the priest? You get the idea. Abbott Costello, that particular sketch yes. is my favorite comedy skit of all time. <laughs> it tears me up, creases me up every single time I watch it. Yeah, but um. With you mentioned you mentioned fi- you mentioned fifty deities, which um, yeah. would it be fair of me to say that it, that it's a that it's a case where you have you have um you have them on kind of a kind of a kind of a tiered setup where you have at the top you have the ones that are go- that are governing huge swaths of concepts, and at the bottom are the are the kind of things that would be considered local or pet or petty gods in some stories. A little of both, if I'm honest with you. At the very top of the tree, shall we say, mm-hmm. we have the Sky God, the one above all. Beyond that, we have their first three children, the Divine Triumvirate, 
and then each of those three has a branch beneath them. The divine triumvirate cover um, protection. The god falls back covers protection. Amorphia covers wild beauty and love, and Jing Shen is balanced spirit and soul. Mm-hmm. Each of them then has children, grandchildren, great grandchildren stretching out beneath them. But even all the way down to the bottom, the concept of the god of the dead is actually right at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Whereas, uh, let's see, the god of the hunt, the idea of the great hunt taken from various mythos from around the world, is quite high. And really, that logically would have been a lower thing developing after civilization. But no, it's up there. Yeah. And with with that kind of... To since you brought up the god of the hunt, I'm cur- I'm curious where your where your equivalent to the got to the god of war would be would um fall would fall in that hierarchy. Uh, the god of war is the grandchild of the god of protection. The god of protection had two sons, one of justice and honor, and one of mountains and solitude. Mm-hmm. The god of justice and honor. As the child, Krieg, who is the god of war, victory, and strength. Yeah. And also the maker of the orc kind. Mm-hmm. And speak, speaking of that, when it comes to when it comes to a lot when it comes to a lot of the fa- when it comes to a lot of the fantasy races, I'm guessing in I'm guessing in each book, um there's a there's a bit of it there's a there's a sides regarding how you might in, how you might integrate but um, different races within within it? Absolutely, each book has at least one fantasy race that is generally associated one of, with one of the mainstream ones. Elves and dwarves are a given; they're pretty much um, multiversal when it comes to TTRPGs. Yeah, and then a few of the others are scattered around. But every book has at least one of the races in, complete with storylines, plot hooks, uh, name generators lore information about their culture and background so each module has a separate race usually specific to the region that that module covers yeah for example the giant king in the ice crystal peaks mm-hmm. now there's a ch- there's there's a term on tv tropes called rls are different um where you where where a, gi- where a given setting might have a, so- a somewhat different take on on cer- on certain fantasy races, um, are there in- are there any instances of of that where um where the com- where the common assumptions with with certain races wouldn't quite fit with that with that region in uh, Primordia? Yes, yeah. lots lots of them. In fact, RLs are different. <laughs> But our elves are massively racist, so they often fall under the category of bad guy because of that. Then they're not that different. <laughs> well, no, that's true. Uh, a good example would be the orc kind. Quite often orcs are portray- portrayed as the bad guys, as villains, as monstrous. Mm-hmm. Usually due to a, a Tolkien-esque version of them being drafted across to whichever setting. Yeah. Our orcs are... Uh, very much a, a militaristic society. They have a strong hierarchy. They have a leadership. Everybody has a, a, a rank mm-hmm. of spots within them. Their, their society is very structured, very orderly. And that's different from the chaos that you usually get from orcs, where they tend to be quite monstrous, with the biggest and strongest being in charge, and then everybody skitters around behind them, just like the Robin Redders. <laughs> They are very. They have. Uh, they can have military parades. They wear uniforms. Everything is smart. They have a certain way of doing things. Mm-hmm. They are. They are ultimately respectful towards other races until you piss them off. <laughs> <laughs> and because they don't have. They're not just enemies of mankind just because they want to be. They have no quarrel with them. So they don't just randomly start attacking. Orcs largely are. A peaceful society, but militaristic, so they are capable of defending themselves and coming to the aid of others. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, gu- I'm guessing in that I'm guessing in that section you'll 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 have a bit of a blurb as to 
potential reasons why why someone in that kind of highly organized militarized society might um, might become an adventure if they if their if their um, character is a orc or even a half orc. Yes, absolutely. Every single race featured in any module has a section on player story hooks to give you ideas of why you're out in the world being an adventurer, mm -hmm. and NPC story hooks, just in case you happen upon one of them and want to know what they're doing there, and you can write that into the story or steer the story in some way. Because they have thoughts and feelings too. Yeah, NPCs, they are people. They are people. <laughs> I have a, I have a shirt I have a, I found a shirt design one once that's once that said N essential NPC do not rob maim or kill does not grant <laughs> does not grant, N does not grant XP but they will <laughs> and within th within that within that um when it comes to you mentioned I I heard you offhandedly mentioning dwarves when I brought when I brought the previous question up. Um, yes. Is it is is it is it, a, it how sim, how similar or di, or different are how similar or different would they be from from a lot of the established setups? You know, living underground, st a lot of stones, a lot of a lot of feudalism, and a whole a whole lot of honor culture and seething hatred of elves. Well, we took that concept and then ran with it and pushed it out the other end. Essentially, all of your standard tropes for dwarves are there. But to the extreme, they don't just live underground dealing with rocks and stones. They are rocks and stones. Yeah, there's a reason why. Why, why did they do this? Is it just for future little gain or is it actually intrinsic to their civilization? Mm -hmm. My dwarves need... Stones, precious metals, and gems, purely to reproduce, or they'll die out. There's no, they're not greedy. They're not doing it to build up vast halls of gold. They literally need them to make more dwarves. And I have a whole section on the lore of that. Because in that, you can have your hierarchy not based on wealth, it's generally based on what kind of minerals can you mine. So if you want yeah. to make a family, if you can only get basic rocks and a couple of little gems here and there, then the people that you make have all different stats, different looks, whereas the more well-off will have gems and emeralds and rubies and they'll be able to make, um, essentially, better classed um, children and different progenies because, as opposed to making any character, um, you're only as good as your flaws, I find. As opposed to making just because uh, it depends on how you play. A lot of people min max. <laughs> yeah. For me, I generally find that the more flaws you can flow in your character, the more entertaining and the more that you can kind of get into a character. Now that's my best I play. Just because I like the villain. With with that, you, now this was kind of hinted when we, when when we talked to, when we talked about the city, but. Um, how f how far how far do you usually how far would would it would the tech level of the of the regions in Primordia be one be one of those modular things or you or do you have a bit of a leaning towards um, the tech level of the setting? Quite often the tech levels it, we I tend to stay within the sort of uh, the set boundaries of high fantasy quite often, mm -hmm. but. Having introduced a, a diesel punk esque feel in one of my parts of the setting, I had to sort of expand upon that. But everything is essentially it's a drag and drop scenario. Mm -hmm. So there are bits that you can take, and as I say, you don't have to use them. So the Edra City section has details on. Um, uh, mass production, industrialization, and all of those changes that are essentially the next step towards the next phase of civilization. Moving from that um, sort of medieval Europe feel into the industrial era. It's, all, it's on the cusp of that region and you can choose to use it or not or take that and wash it over the entire setting and say, oh, this is, uh, this is 100 years later. 
or remove it entirely and say, well, this is 50 years before and that's not happened yet. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that, in, with that in mind, um, when it comes to when it comes to classes, when it comes to when it comes to archetypes, um, I get the feeling a lot a lot of archetypes and a lot of classes would cert would certainly fit, but there's there's a few that there's a few that I'm cu I'm curious how I'm curious how th how they'd work, and that's mainly in the um, casting end of things. Is Okay. Obviously, obviously, in something like D and D, there's a um, there's a narrative di there's a narrative difference between between di between different arcane casters, um, wiz wizards, so wizards, sorcerers, and um, warlocks. Yeah. Um, when it comes when it comes to the way magic is when it comes to the way magic is set up, is there is the is the um, is it would it be set up that there would be that it's possible to have different types of magical traditions? Uh, yes, in a sense, um, that will be explored in a, a, a later module than the four that we've just done. Mm -hmm. um, having to make it system agnostic has meant that we couldn't put too much detail in. But we had to have enough that it fit into each system. So there has to be enough so that Dungeons and Dragons can plug in and go, ah, these are our schools of magic. But there has to be not so much that a low magic setting is put off by the idea. Mm -hmm. So yes, there there are um, spheres of influence or um, schools of magic or whatever the other thing is. Each system calls it a different thing, but it's essentially the same scenario. Now, with the, with that in mind, what what would you, what would you be shooting for as far as page count with each book? Each um, module. Oh, well, perhaps take it. He's not spoken in a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, but again, this is not the one writing it. I just uh, sit, play the game, and look pretty. Um, yeah, as far as page counts, we're kind of running towards fifty-two. Cover, cover. Because um, with that one, it's not too big. Um, that obviously leaves enough for us to have uh, enough plot hooks in there, so you can take it and run with it, and also have enough um, space in there to uh, allow some battle maps and as much artwork as possible, just to kind of give you a flavour. Um, the idea with each module is, yes, hopefully they do flow into each other, but we to make it as simple as possible, so that you don't have to plan too much around them either. It could literally be you sat around with your friends and then like, oh, do you want to, do you want to, do you want to play a game? <laughs> and then like, yes, when do you want to do it? Like now. You don't have to plan it. You don't have to go through the dueling diaries. You could literally just be sat around with a couple of drinks and like, all right, let's just, let's just run with it and see what happens. Right, okay, this is your location. This is where you are. Make your characters. Boom, 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 boom. Here's some ideas. And then, uh, oh, well, what are we going to do? Well, let's roll on this. Boom. Right, okay, we're traveling off. We're going to go find this thing. It's to make it as streamlined as possible, and as I said, make it very inclusive, and also just take the time scale out of it. You don't have to study on this in order to play. So yeah, with with the figured 50, 50, 52 would be a good page good page number because it's not too daunting, and uh, it's big words as well, um, as in <laughs> big font because I'm blind as a bat, so it makes it a lot easier for me to read as well. All right. No. And um, with that in mind, what would you what would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window for the for this quartet? Uh, we initially put April. Um, main reason being is writing it and everything's fine. It's also getting it um, stylized up, and then the artwork. Because luckily, we managed to get enough funding to hit our only stretch goal, which was enough money so we could actually afford uh, an artist, so we didn't have to issue his public domain. Uh, images and we also want to factor in unfortunately because of the climate that we're in the offshoot that if there was another uh, unfortunate uh, lockdown um, where because we mainly do all of our work from this um, office because <laughs> I don't have a laptop or a computer at home and neither does he everything that we have is literally based in this this little studio that we do all our work from 
Um, but yeah, if there was a lockdown, it was supposed to be uh, given that in mind so that if there was some time away, that we would comfortably get it out. We're hoping we can get something at least moderately done before the end of the year. Yeah. But April is the absolute the absolute latest. We are definitely hoping to get that done, hopefully, way before then. And with and I'll I'll certainly be keeping a close eye on how on how on how it develops, as I as I always as I always do as I always do I seem to be always wa I seem to be always watching. <laughs> <laughs> always watching, <laughs> always watching with that thing. Um, I don't know I don't know maybe, I don't know maybe maybe in maybe in twenty years I'll I'll achieve my final. I'll achieve my final form, and there, and there, and, and there, there'll be some, there'll be some unblinking eye, and so when someone rolls a one, I, I'll just, I'll just echo in their head, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> Although, Sound of thousands of masters quickly scratching down an idea there, like, oh yes, <laughs> I'll have that. <laughs> <laughs> um. But with but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you guys for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come onto my little corner of the crazy of this crazy internet and enjoy enjoy the particular bit of madness that happens around here. It's the greatest shit show on earth, my friend. What can I say? We love this. <laughs> Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As oh, I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah. Get your hands off my head flaps. No, 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 no. There you go. <laughs> to, to, to you, my friend. <laughs> go. Ah, oh, because it is five o'clock. It is five o'clock. It is five o'clock. There you go. Five o'clock for us, therefore, you can have a drink too, my friend. <laughs> there you go. I'm on, I'm on long time. I'm What's always it? drinking. Oh, yeah. To those drinking, just say no. It's five o'clock for us, so you know, could drink that. Yeah. <laughs> but so. But it's Saturday. We're British, so we started six hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> and of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>